Hi, good afternoon, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I have to say that a lot of my talk um, overlaps with what Dr. Kluver uh, already went through, so if there are any things that overlap, I will uh, just uh, jump across. And um, I want to say, before I start, thank you to Dr. Nadia for starting the theme of keeping it real today. I really appreciate it because I think the issue with mental health, as we've discussed, we've heard in Dr. Kluver's talk and also many other speakers have spoken today about how important it is to address mental health in the settings with the resources that are available. And as somebody who works in a low middle income setting, I have a few things to share with you all that I hope will be helpful for you today. So um, in the next 15 minutes, I'll really talk about what we actually mean by integrating mental health care and why the WHO endorses uh, this uh, form of care delivery. Um, Dr. Kluver has been through a lot of um, points about why it's important, but I'll emphasize this talk about um, what we've done in Asia. And Dr. Kluver talked about some wonderful things that have been done in Africa and also um, some words of wisdom from the supervising um, psychiatrist that looks after our collaborative care program in Bangkok in case it's useful for you. So um, as a clinician, we're very passionate about looking after our patients and I'm very grateful actually to have listened to Dee's talk today. I thought it was very moving and I think um, this patient um, reminded me about why it's so important that we, we do this work. And so she's a patient that I met about two years ago, 20 year old transgender woman who was diagnosed with um, HIV and after diagnosis uh, was put onto TLD, was virally suppressed. And her cycle social history was that she was living with her parents and unusually were actually very, for Thai culture anyway, were very accepting of her HIV diagnosis and they were very uh, supportive emotionally and financially at the time was a high school student and was pretty open to us from the outset that she used a lot of alcohol and other um, recreational drugs ketamine ecstasy injected crystal methamphetamine and at one point during her care actually came to us and said look I really want to give up these drugs can I see a psychiatrist and saw the psychiatrist once and then uh, changed her mind and was lost to follow up um, and didn't really take the psychiatric medication. And when, at this point, when we saw her, she, she actually had come to the emergency room because she was physically abused by her boyfriend. Uh, our team went to see her in the emergency room. The PHQ-9 was 17, which is uh, high. And she said to us from the outset that she didn't want to see a psychiatrist this time around, even though she knew she was quite stressed out. Stop taking her ART because she was just feeling fed up. And so the question I want to ask you in the audience is, if you were in the situation where you were in a low income country, the patient didn't want to see a specialist, and you probably had limited resources anyway and sending her across, how you would manage this patient in quite um, an extreme situation. And you know that if you left it, it would affect her overall health and her HIV outcomes as well in terms of um, the integrated mental health care model. And so I just want to touch on what do we actually mean by integration? And so essentially it's use receipt of elements of one service incorporated into the regularly functioning of another service. So for example, in our service in Bangkok, we primarily provide HIV care, but as non-mental health care specialists, we provide mental health care all within the same clinic. And so it's inclusion of mental health care into general hospitals or primary care. And another key word I want to emphasize with it is the continuity of care between different providers and health systems and the collaboration between care providers. I think it sounds like a fancy word, but I think anybody who's tried to collaborate between teams knows that it's a lot of healthcare systems are complicated. There's a lot of politics and it's fragmented. And I think collaboration takes a lot of effort and work. And so although I, I feel that it's a lot of work, but it's so worth it for the patients. And of course, promotion of self-care is always very, very useful. And um, Dr. Kluver and, and other speakers today have already touched on mobile health technologies and how this can help to overcome many of the logistical challenges that low to middle income countries are faced with. And also regarding staff, and we had a lot of challenges with implementing this into our settings as well, was capacity building because a lot of staff were worried about, well, we're not specialists. We're going to be dealing with people who are trying to kill themselves 
do we have the skills, how do we manage this? And so there was a lot of capacity building by the specialists in the beginning. And not just redefinition of roles for the people in the primary care settings, but also for the mental health specialists themselves. So instead of seeing patients themselves, uh, becoming more of a supervisor and supporting not just the mental health care of the patient, but also the mental health care of the very stressed non-specialists trying to deliver this health care in very resource-limited settings. Um, so Dr. Nadia talked a lot about this morning and the challenges that she's faced in Nigeria about um, the lack of the, the very limited resources and other challenges that um, they face in, in their settings. And I think this graph from uh, the Mental Health Atlas from 2020 really shows that if you look at um, the African region and the Southeast Asian region where I work and you compare it to the number of mental health care specialists that are available per 100,000 populations, the numbers are hugely different. I mean, we only have you know, about one to five per 100,000 compared to about 50 in um, the European region. And so this is the challenge that the reality, the, the reality check that we're faced with. And so Dr. Kluver already mentioned this, that we know that mental health conditions disproportionately affect people affected by HIV. And by integrating mental health care into services that already exist, it improves access to care and, of course, improves adherence and outcomes, as uh, we saw in, in the wonderful graphs seen in Dr. Kluver's presentation, and also helps to prevent new HIV infections through treatment as prevention, improves overall health and well-being. And I think the important thing for low to middle income countries is that it it's a feasible, affordable, and cost-effective uh, delivery system. And so for the next three slides, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what we've been able to do thanks to Dr. Annette Sohn, um, Milton Weinberg, through the D43 program that they're supporting us um, in the Asia Pacific region. And I'm just going to talk about what we've done at our center, and I'll talk about what has been done in other centers in the Asia Pacific in a minute. So we did a collaborative care model and integrated mental health care into our existing HIV care clinic. We only had in the beginning one supervising psychiatrist who in the beginning was completely overwhelmed by the number of um, people living with HIV with mental health problems we were sending across to him. And so we decided that he was going to supervise us to help us look after our own patients. So we had uh, monthly conferences and our existing team, you can see on the screen, are made up of pediatricians, some of us are sitting here, uh, social workers, health advisors, psychologists, and peer supporters. And we routinely screened for PHQ-9, which we didn't do previously. Um, the supervising psychiatrist provided us with a directed mental health care protocol, which basically meant he would give us advice on how to act on different scores, how to manage um, people with suicidal ideation, how to prescribe basic uh, um, psychiatric antidepressants. And the advantage of this was the kids trusted us. They had an ongoing existing rapport with us because many of these children have been being looked after us all of their life because many of them are, uh, have perinatal HIV. And the scope of care was not as scary as I think many of us feared in the, be oops, in the beginning. Um, so managing depressive symptoms, suicidal risk management, and also other mental health disorders that were very common in this group. So many of them had other mental health disorders that were hiding, such as bipolar disorder, OCD, and also um, another very common challenge we have is substance addiction. Uh, some of you may know that ca cannabis was recently legalized in Thailand, and many of our teenagers also use crystal amphetamines. And uh, these are some numbers that I want to show you from uh, what we did through this program so far. So between uh, 2020 and 2021, we uh, screened 376 youth, and a quarter of these had high PHQ-9 scores or suicidal ideation. And of these uh, 25%, we managed to look after 85% of those through counseling and counseling or, or counseling plus pharmacotherapy within our non-specialist team. The people, the, 20, the same 25% of these people at one year follow-up, 91 were still retained in care. And um, at the end of the one year, 57% um, had resolution of depressive symptoms. And so I think this was very encouraging from our side. Um, there's uh, an abstract booked in, in this conference where uh, we've talked um, in an abstract about the facilitators and barriers and feasibility and acceptability 
of that we did interviews with both um, service users and service providers to see what they thought about the implementation of this model that you can go and have a look at if you're interested. And this graph really uh, is just to show you that the overall um, prevalence of suicidal ideation in the same group I just talked about was approximately 15%. But you can see that um, in the non-perinatally acquired HIV, so those that acquired HIV later on in life, had a much higher prevalence of suicidal ideation. And um, the gray bar shows those with suicidal thoughts only, and the dark part shows those who had suicidal thoughts and acted on them. And you can see that comparing people with perinatal HIV, um, those with um, non-perinatally acquired HIV were much more likely to actually go through with uh, their suicidal attempt, which I think was a very practical point that we learned through the study in terms of how we need to risk, be risk managing our patients when we have a limited number of staff hours to look after our patients. And there's more details in a poster that um, is also um, here at this conference, uh, number 56. Um, this is work from one of my colleagues at the Tangerine Clinic that um, is a transgender-led service where they screened for um, depression and also um, integrated this into their usual services. And you can see that the uptake for people in these services was very good. And so um, how this is being delivered in other clinics in Thailand. Um, like I mentioned, Chimera is the capacity development for HIV and mental health research in Asia. And I've just um, given a few examples of what's going on in the region. It's a D43 um, with funding from the Fogarty uh, International Center and NIMH and led by Annette Sohn and Milton Weinberg. Um, I'm one of, one of the 16 current trainees and it's nested in IDEA Asia Pacific. And there are studies that are um, all the way from pre-implementation to implementation um, stages from um, the feasibility and acceptability of screening to the implementation of electronic depression uh, screening tools. And also uh, Timothy Dazon in the Philippines is also uh, looking at the acceptability and adoption of uh, integration of telebehavioral health in primary care in his settings. Um, so Dr. Kluver talked about uh, Zvandiri and the wonderful Friendship Bench. There's work being done um, in Rwanda with a trauma-informed uh, CBT integrated to usual care. Uh, Tanzania has done uh, some wonderful work with SYV and Dr. Kluver also talked about uh, the VUCA family program that's integrated family-based psychosocial interventions um, in South Africa. And this is really my final slide before we uh, talk about the, the case I presented in the beginning. So uh, Dr. Paul is the um, supervising psychiatrist that looks after our uh, collaborative care model. And he's given us these three steps. So if you find yourself in the setting where you don't have any of this going on and you wanna get started, what he suggests you do. And the first step, if you forget everything else that I've said today is number one, get buy-in from a psychiatrist. You don't have to have many, but if you have buy-in from a psychiatrist who can support you to supervise setting something up where you can collaborate and task share to non-specialists, you have a starter and that's how we started our center. Once you have buy-in from a psychiatrist, if you can have a case manager to manage this project, have an emergency, a mental health emergency plan for your patients and so trying to encourage self-care once you have those care packages in place, then you can start screening. So we don't suggest screening if there's nothing that you can do about it, if there's something abnormal. Then going on to uh, counseling, medication, and also setting goals, um, plan durations, and referrals if necessary. And of course, 10th, but the most important thing is to keep it integrated and collaborating. So I just have two minutes left, and I just want to say that the case I talked about in the beginning um, we eventually, through the integrated, the collaborative care model we gave, in-house counseling, uh, the supervising psychiatrist um, suggested we give an antidepressant. He thought that the symptoms we were telling him about were consistent with bipolar disorder, so the patient was screened for that. And we tried to, I know somebody spoke about trying to frame things in a positive um, picture for patients, and that's what he suggested for this patient too, to try and focus on life goals, what he's gonna save up for. And also I was having a conversation with our colleagues from PNG, uh, I think they may have gone now, but about how important this is to support caregivers as well, um, to try and support their teenager. So the teenager eventually restarted ART and they're still engaged um, in care at the moment. So these are my take home messages, really that mental health care integration is in the incorporation of mental health care into another regular service. And uh, it's really, really suitable to low to middle income countries because it increases access, 
um, improves healthcare outcomes and it's cost effective and it's very feasible and affordable. Um, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Annette Sloan, my um, advisor, Professor Chan Yui, and all of the wonderful team in Thailand and uh, Columbia University for making this possible. If you'd like any more information, please check out our website um, on the right-hand side. Thank you. Thank you.